to have passion in life is everything. What's your Everest? Oh, is it yeah. that 200-inch buck? They just look so impressive when they're wide. Especially running away. <laughs> Welcome to this week's episode of Eastman's Elevated. It's like a think tank for outdoor activity. It sounds exactly like my hunting. Just always thinking about it, always trying to evolve it and make it better. Here's your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? Got a brand new Eastman's Elevated for you. So on this week's podcast, I have back on my friend Jason Matzinger. Uh, Dan Picar also sits in on the conversation as this was recorded live at the expo. Uh, so I always like sitting down with like-minded bow hunters, and, and this is just a great recording. Uh, Jason Matzinger absolutely gets after it. And I met Jason about 20 years ago, and I've told this story on the podcast before, but we met on the construction site Uh, while he was still an electrician and I was a carpenter doing the project and we hit it off and we've stayed in touch ever since. Uh, I really like Jason. Uh, He's a really talented hunter, talented videographer. Uh, His films tell such a good story. So uh, make sure to go check out his TV show. Make sure to check out his films. He's just putting out next level uh, uh, movies and, and videos and such. So, uh, make sure to check those out. And, uh, with that, we'll get into it. I really enjoyed this podcast. I just need to thank a couple of my sponsors. I want to thank Vector Custom Arrows. Jason Matzinger is also shooting Vector Custom Arrows. It's a custom arrow shop where you put in your specifics on your bow and and they build you an arrow with a dynamic spine that perfectly mates up to your bow, your poundage, your draw length. Uh, And when you get that perfect match, you just get great accuracy. They have a couple different shafts. They have their HMR, which is their hammer. It comes in fairly heavy, which is great for sound, vibration, forgiveness. Uh, It's also great for penetrating power. Uh, The laws of momentum energy and kinetic energy always favor a heavier arrow. Uh, So it's a great arrow. Uh, They just have great craftsmanship in these arrows with their fletchings, front end components, with their knocks. Just a super arrow. And that arrow for me came in at around 540 or so with a 125 head. This year, the arrow I'll be using is the ZMR, which is uh, catered a little bit more towards Western hunting, Um, and it just depends on your preferences and your bow setup and such, but I really like this ZMR. It comes in at about 450 grains for me with a 125 head. Uh, It's a a micro diameter arrow. Uh, Again, great fletching. They get great helical on them, and I've been building arrows for the last 20 years, and the arrows they built for me in the ZMR, I just got my bow all set up and ready to go for bear season and for hunts this year. Uh, and his arrows are outperforming mine that I've built. So I'm super impressed by their quality. The ZMR, it should be out already. If not, it'll be out in the next week or two. So just check in with their website. But just a great shooting arrow, a great company, and thanks to Vector for their support. I also want to thank Onyx. Onyx has just changed the way that I scout and hunt, and I use these for absolutely all my hunts. I build my hunt plan on them. You can color code your waypoints. You can label your waypoints. You can share them with buddies in real time. So if you're at a point or you want to create a meeting point, uh, you can create that waypoint. And this is... um, a great feature for me because back in the day I used to draw hand-drawn maps and um, I don't know how we all made it to where we needed to go but uh, sometimes it was worrisome but this um, Onyx being able to share waypoints create routes uh, for crossing you know public land land bridges that open up other public uh, and it's it's nice to just always know where you stand and hunt with confidence And also routes for sketchy terrain or routes that you need to take in the dark. There's so many uses. Uh, They're constantly evolving this program. You get satellite imagery. You get uh, topography. Or you can get a hybrid of both. Just a great program. I use it absolutely all the time for every hunt I go on. If you're not a member, make sure to check out Onyx. I also want to thank Stone Glacier. Uh, Stone Glacier is a great company, and and this year I'll be using their sleep system. So uh, I'm using their tents. Uh, They have a a great skyscraper two-person, which is a bomb-proof four-season tent. Um, This tent will uh, get you through any storm. You've got a lot of room. You can sit up, get dressed. Uh, Just a a great all-around tent. Uh, This year I'm also using their Sky Air. Their Sky Air is a bivy tent. 
It's one of the lightest tents you can get, and it, it, it's a modular system where you can add a floor in it, uh, you can add a vestibule, uh, or you can just take the raw tent. And so it gives you some options there for your shelter, great for early season, great for traveling light. Uh, I also really like their sleeping bags. I think they have some of the best sleeping bags on the market. They make a zero degree. They make a 15 degree. Uh, just get you through any elements that you're going to find out west. And like I say, just a great company. I like all those guys there all the gear that they come out with. So if you're in the market for a new sleep system, make sure to check out Stone Glacier. I also want to thank Eastman's for their support of everything I do, the podcast, uh, videos and such. Make sure to check out what we have out there. Uh, you can check out our YouTube channel, uh, Eastman's Beyond the Grid or Eastman's Hunting TV. Uh, Eastman's Hunting TV is on the Outdoor channel, so set your DVR for that. And just some great new episodes coming out that I'm really proud about and then working on new projects for this year. Uh, so just trying to further my uh, videography uh, further my my storytelling just trying to uh, to learn year from year and come out with the absolute best content I can uh, Dan Picard does a great job as well uh, he captures some awesome videos every year captures some awesome hunts and uh, the guy's just a go-getter and a great bow hunter so make sure to check those out check out uh, Eastman's Tag Hub. Uh, you can put in the promo code Brian, save you a little bit there. Uh, it's our internet research tool for researching these out-of-state hunts and opportunities. And I'm starting to see some results come back. I haven't drawn anything yet, but um, I'm hoping for some uh, good tags in my future. But uh, Eastman's Tag Hub help get you educated on what all these western states offer. Also, make sure to check out the magazines, Eastman's Hunting Journal, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal. You can put in the promo code ELEVATED321. That'll get you both magazines and an outdoor edge knife for $50. And um, with that, man, just working away here. Uh, just in the grind, got that bow totally set up, ready for bear season here. So super stoked about that. Going to start getting some days out and getting after those things. And, um, yeah, just getting some responsibilities done, some work done, and um, getting excited for this hunting season. Uh, so that's what I'm up to. But let's get into this podcast. It's a great one. So my buddy Dan Picard sits in. Uh, my buddy Jason Matzinger, just an awesome videographer, uh, awesome hunter, so knowledgeable, uh, born and raised in, in Bozeman, Montana, uh, just a great all around guys. So uh, we'll get into it. Eastman's Elevated. I'm your host, Brian Barney. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we all love hunting and that stuff, but I looked as much, I looked as forward to every Friday and going watching a football game as, you know, being right in the middle of the elk. So it's, yep. it's fun to hit that, that place in life where you got just, right in that sweet spot i feel like you know mm -hmm. so i got a lot to look forward to but all right. that sounds awesome like mm -hmm. being able to watch your kid it, it's changed my life obviously the whole i have a whole different perspective now mm -hmm. you know having a kid it, it's I, you can't plan for it either no like that's the other thing that i realize i'm like yeah i'm ready for this or i know what it's going to be like but yeah you don't mm -hmm. you don't know what it's like until you're actually doing it there's no handbook and as much as no. anything you like kind of got to figure it out as you go you yeah. know and every kid <laughs> is different they're an individual uh but yeah it, it's um so fun to be able to mentor them too like in these sports like uh have those moments when you can talk to them and and um oh, yeah. you know let them know like what they're doing right or their attitude or they you know it's like uh, under high pressure your situations is when they learn the best or when oh, any of totally. us learn the best yep yeah yep. super yep. cool you're gonna like it heck yeah mm -hmm. looking forward to it well i'm live here i've got jason matzinger i got dan Bacar. we're here at the expo and um lucky enough to get jason in the booth and talk some hunting yeah appreciate you having me on here yeah uh, man you've been busy you've been producing a lot of good films uh those <laughs> episodes that. are killing it yeah thanks man it's uh hard to believe i'm transitioning into the 12th season of doing this full time already and you know I know we've talked about it in the past but just or what you even just said I mean time flies you know and uh, hard to believe we're we're here but I appreciate you saying that man I really uh, have taken a lot of pride in the films and the conservation you know working with guys like MDF and RMEF and Wild Sheep and 
just helping tell that story. You know, we can't get it out there enough, and mm-hmm. I just I really enjoy it and the people involved. Yeah, the the Mule Deer Foundation uh, video is amazing. Episodes are amazing. Twelve years. That's um, that's wild, but. Um, you keep improving and getting better and better at telling the story and getting the shots you need. <laughs> like um, uh, uh, your your episodes, your shows, your films, uh, they tell such a story. I appreciate that, yeah. yeah. And that's what I've always tried to focus on is the animals or the habitat versus my personal goals. You know, how is it relatable to everybody out there? Because I don't think, you know, I don't think people are going to be invested in somebody's personal goals for 12 years. You know what I mean? So I think that what what has given me that longevity is never making the focus about me or what I'm trying to do. Even though I have those goals while I'm out there, you know, it's always been trying to tell the story about the animal or the conservation behind it or, or that kind of thing. And so I really think that that's been the, you know, it's the passion for me, but I think that's also what's given me 12 years here, yeah. you know? That's exactly right. Yeah, the, the passion for it. Yeah. Uh, 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 loving what you do and loving what you capture. You totally. Know, that's the key. Uh, and if you didn't have that, uh, I don't think you'd be nearly as successful. It's like <laughs> your love for it that, that comes out on film or that shows like uh, in these films. So, yeah, man, it's cool to watch, cool to see. And, um, you know, we've told the story before, but, yeah, we met on a construction site talking hunting. Yeah, know, and exactly. Wild, wild to be sitting <laughs> no here kidding. yeah, a dozen years later and, and you've been doing it for 12 years. 13, 14 years later, and uh, uh, to remain friends through all of it, and then to watch your success has been really fun. Yeah, likewise. It's been, yeah. Yeah, we were working on a job site. I was an electrician, and him and his dad and brother were the, the builders on the job, and you know how it is. You kind of get to know a guy. We start talking hunting pretty soon. He's busting out pictures, showing me stuff. I'm like, damn, this dude knows what he's doing, you know? And we, yeah, so been friends ever since. That's pretty awesome. cool. Yeah, Jason gave me some good tips um, hunting out in a spot in Montana that I wanted to explore. And you just get talking hunting. And he had so much experience over there, kind of pointed me in some good directions and got me started over there. So, yeah, I always, I always remember that. Um, uh, man, and a um, dozen years ago, like... Uh, you were a great hunter back then too muleys and bulls like you've been getting after it for a bunch of years um uh, it's a it's a tough skill set to build isn't it it takes years of work and dedication oh yeah for sure and just like you know a lot of things it's constantly evolving you know the the landscape or the wildlife what areas are good where you know where there's better trophy potential versus you know uh numbers and that kind of thing you start to figure out where you fit in and what you what what drives you you know and so yeah it's constant evolution of trying to figure out the animals but also tell the stories associated around them because you know that's getting back to it i mean that's why we do what we do and and um so yeah it's pretty crazy and it's funny because you know, with today's technology, a lot of people, they don't know that we all have this backstory. You know, you hear this whole, oh, doing it for the gram or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> you know, we did this long before there was the gram. You know, we we did this when the gram was like photo albums in local sporting goods yeah. stores, you know. And yep. there's nothing wrong with that. Like, people love going and looking at those photo albums and stuff like that. I mean, it was a big part of growing up and something that inspired me was to, like, be one of those guys in those books in the local sporting goods store, you know, holding the spring bear or whatever it may be. And so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's always awesome to sit there and listen to somebody's backstory because everybody that's in this room, everybody that does have a presence worked really hard to get there you know like the old saying the guy on top of the mountain didn't fall there you know and i i always think about that and and yeah to your credit i mean both of you i've known i've known both of you guys before any of us were doing this professionally yep you know yep and and yeah you guys have busted your ass from the day i've ever met you and so it is cool to be sitting here and talking about it and yeah, you guys, um, you know what it takes to get out there and get it done every year. And I've always looked up to you guys for that, you Thank know. You. Yeah, it, um, 
it takes a lot of hard work that people don't see. Like you say, talking that backstory or how many years you were working at it. When I met you, uh, I'd, I'd seen, I'd bought a, a Zing uh, DVDs at the bow shop and in there and uh, <laughs> yeah. seen some of your films there. But it, it wasn't even like uh, uh, 12 years ago that you just started. You had been doing it years before and honing <laughs> your, your hunting skill for years before. And, and um, yeah, I, I think you're right. People don't see all the work that goes into where you get. They just see the end goal and I you know you'd mentioned doing it for the gram and it's it's like you almost have to do it for the right reasons if you want to be successful like if it, oh, if yeah. you're if your only interest is being uh, uh, you know like a, I know arrowing critters or, or harvesting critters is our end goal but if you're just there to, to show off for, for the Instagram or if you're in it for the wrong reasons, I don't think you're going to get too far. No. You're not going to have a 12-year career making films unless you absolutely love what you do and are in it for the right reasons. And um, you do a good job of like um, uh, uh, enjoying the entire adventure and experience and then telling that story throughout. No, it's not easy to do. And, yeah. and Dan, you've got a, a long history as well of guiding and uh, getting in and uh, working behind the camera for a lot of yeah. years, yep. honing your bow hunting skills to be able to get to where you've got as well. Yeah, no, it's just thinking about what you're saying. And, and man, when we started doing this or, or, and you started filming, I mean, that's a long time ago. And, you know, you grew up hunting with your dad. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was big and that was big in my life too. And we started filming our hunts for fun we love to do it it had nothing to do with the gram it didn't yeah. have anything to do that you know we wanted to be famous or whatever we just love getting out there and capturing those memories and sharing them with our families totally that's how it all started i'm sure that's how it started for you too a hundred percent my dad and uh george deeruff which i'm sure you guys yep. have met powderhorn george um yeah, but they filmed on eight millimeter cameras so when i was growing up they were only two minutes per reel and you would have to project it on a wall. So I remember our family would get together and, uh, you know, maybe twice a year, and we'd bust out all those eight millimeter rolls and set it up, no sound on them, of course, and project it. We'd have to take one painting off the wall so we had a big enough spot <laughs> yeah. to project it. Yep. And we'd just sit around and watch these, yeah, soundless films with the projector. and. So, and I've used some of that footage in, in telling my story through the years, but yeah, like old watching them bow hunt caribou in Quebec and, you know, filming sheep over by Gardner by Devil's Slide and, you know, wintering elk up by West Yellowstone. And so, I mean, I, I came by it naturally because I grew up watching my dad and his friends do it. And yeah, there was no such thing as social media. They did it because they loved it and it, it became a part of my life. And from the time I was little, it was just kind of part of it, mm -hmm. you know, like that's all I ever saw was my dad and his buddies getting out there and that that's what I wanted to do. And so for me, yeah, it was never even something that I had to make this conscious decision of. It was just always a part of hunting for me and my family, yep. you yep. know? And yeah, next thing I know, I had a hundred hunts on camera that just for fun and all of a sudden it was like, huh, I think maybe I could do something with this, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, about that time, John Edwards came in and purchased Schnee's and the powder horn and uh, was kind of looking to ramp up their marketing. And so I, I said, hey, you know, I've, I've lived here my whole life. Powder horn is where I've bought all my sporting goods since I was a little kid. George has outfitted me with my first slingshot, arrows, boots, sleeping bag, game bags, everything you know and uh so it was this natural fit because i had you know kind of documented the founder of the powder horn and his hunting career and so that's where it all started yep yep and it was it wasn't this it wasn't like i yeah it's hard to, it was just natural yeah. you know everything just fell into place i didn't put this big mastermind plan together or how i was going to launch this show or anything i just literally yep. fell into it, it i mean <laughs> it's funny you say that because i i get asked that all the time like well how did you get into what you you do and especially with you know videoing hunts and it's like i i never planned to get into it i 
I just started filming the family hunts when we were kids. I, and I, I know you did. it's the exact same thing with your family. And it just kind of fell into place because we just were out there, we're doing it. And then, yeah, before you know it, you're like, wow, there's, there's a need for content. And it kind of just develops there. But we're just out there doing it because we loved it. Yeah. And it was part of the family. Yeah. And, and I, that's a cool part of it is I never thought in a million years I'd be doing what I'm doing today. Like I, I don't Me neither. See, I don't see no. myself as that special of a hunter. I try hard, and I I know I've gotten better over the years, but I never saw myself as any better than anybody else as far as being a good hunter. I just like to capture it on video and have fun. Totally, that's what it was all about. Mm -hmm. And it just snowballed into what it is now, which is awesome, and I'm so grateful. And you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. But yeah, it's not like I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna be a you know on TV when I grow up. <laughs> right. It was never like that. Right, it was never like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Thank you. like it, it is like uh, living a dream when you get to turn your your passion into your job, and it, it never feels like I'm working, whether I'm writing an article or sitting here talking to you guys or trying to to put together a film. You know, it's like what we love to do and what we'd be doing anyways. You know, we just um, uh, figured out a way to be able to monetize it and turn it into a living, you know, and be able to, like, uh, uh, doing that, then we're really able to put more focus into it as well. But without building that that core hunting skill, yep. um, without uh, uh, figuring out how to read the landscape and turn up critters and uh, uh, figure out how to execute and hold our composure, without putting all those skills together, it, it there wouldn't be much to capture, you know. So the, the love for it is what's got us all to where we're at. And that has to be the foundation because I, I know guys too that, you know, they hunt on camera and, you know, it's, it's work, right? I mean, now it's work, but how do you, how do you deal with that pressure, right? There's, there's a lot at stake when you, you have to, now we have to get content for, you know, our, our companies, whatever we're doing. So the, the level of pressure that's there is extensive. I mean, you're not just, well, I was going to say, we're not just hunting for the heck of it anymore with, with, you know with no intention of each hunt. We still have those hunts, go on doe antelope hunts or, you know, hunts with the family, sure. but j just dealing with the level of pressure to produce, like how have you dealt with that over the years, uh, Jason? Honestly, I, I set a precedence, I guess, for myself when I did this. And I, I always said, I'm never gonna kill an animal to make a film. I'm never gonna kill an animal because yep. I need one more episode. And I've never had to. You know, I've never once had to because I'm creative, you know, and what I mean by that is I don't feel the pressure to kill an animal because I know I can tell a great hunting story without having to take that animal's life. So I wait until I see an animal that gets me so friggin' excited. I don't know whether to grab my camera or my bow or my rifle or it gets me so rattled. I know that's the one and I hunt until I feel that. And I've never went against that, you know, and at times you're right, you're sitting there looking at the year and you're like, man, I, it's been a tough year. I don't have a lot. But what I've learned is, is make, you can make an episode about trying to make an episode where you don't kill anything and people <laughs> love it, Yeah, you know, because it's real. It's real. Yeah. And so I think that once, you know, you let go of what you think you have to do and you just do what comes naturally and feels good to you and you stay true to yourself and and do it for the right reasons it, it won't ever backfire yep. you know so for me i've been able to just always have so much faith in that that i've never felt that pressure yep. you know it's really good you can think through that and approach it that way and and it's the same way that that i try to approach it where i don't you know you definitely um you know i know eastman's has things invested and um sure i want to harvest an animal but i'd be there with or without the camera on each and every hunt yes. that i do yes and i try to really do it for the love of it you know and it's like when you can um uh enjoy the experience and the adventure and it's where i want to be it's like the i, I wouldn't be any other place on planet earth but right here right now trying to harvest this buck in the ultimate chess match of trying to totally. figure it out and get into range and i get immersed into that where 
Um, yeah, it does. I've never shot an animal to make a film. Like, uh, uh, there'd be a lot of decent four points or decent six points that would have died to make a film. Exactly. But yeah. uh, I kind of hold out to, for what gets me excited, like you stated, like something that gets me charged up that I want to go try to harvest and then try to capture it along the way. So, totally. like, um, uh, definitely want to. Uh, perform and give it my all but yeah I just found like I, I like to immerse myself in the experience and take it in because it is those rare moments where we get to be out there for a week long and challenge yep. ourselves physically and mentally you know and so um, and, and then just try to document it along the way and a lot of it is turning that camera on when I don't want to when I fail or when I make a mistake like, a, like you stuff. said yep. authenticity that raw emotion you know and so like the minute you, you make a mistake or things are going tough uh, that's what kind of makes the best films is when you can capture that and tell them the story like what you do jason yeah Yeah. it's um and and so yeah i mean i'm sure you guys get the question a lot like man i really want to do what you do how do how do i do that and so to go right back to what we're talking about i just say you know stay true to yourself be who you are not who you think people want to see or don't copy what's been done because that's already been done like just just be yourself be authentic do things for the right reasons do it with quality and there's room for you you know there's room in this building for for more and more people who do good work you know so i think people can look at it and feel overwhelmed or like there's not a chance for them to to do this but there is and i i don't think it's that hard you know just yep. stay true to yourself and and do things for the right reasons and and that this this community will lift you up yep. you know mm-hmm. that's a beautiful so. thing i love hearing you guys talk about that why you're doing it and you're staying true to yourself that's what it takes that's what it takes you you have to hunt for yourself and maybe depending on the situation the the video is a bonus or the video just kind of goes along with it but if you're hunting for the right reasons then there's really no pressure no there's not that's right there's not i'm a big believer in karma and like forces in the universe and you know you you get back what you put out uh treat people how you want you know all those things i believe in them wholeheartedly so much that i mean all my faith is in that that things happen for a reason and when it's right it's right when it's wrong it's wrong so as frustrated as i get at times when like that bull i've been chasing all year i got him at 80 yards and the wind switches for five seconds and blows the whole thing up for me, which happened about a thousand times this <laughs> last year. <laughs> I just have to remind myself, it just wasn't my time. And when you do really believe in that, man, yeah, it's, you can go back to camp happy and you're not that like pissed off, angry guy that gets back to camp and's bitter. And, like nobody wants yeah. to be in camp with that guy. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, and so you go out there the next day, and you're like, maybe today's my day. Maybe today yep. the wind will hold for 10 more seconds, which it never did last <laughs> year. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so like you say, when you do hunt for the right reasons and for yourself more than anybody and, and what makes you happy, yep. then you can show that message better, tell that story better. And like I said, People will recognize it and they'll lift you up because of it because they appreciate it. Yep. You know, people appreciate it. Well, I'm glad to hear you fail as well. Like, uh, you've killed <laughs> so many big bulls in a row. Like, you're so good at hunting those big, mature bulls, you know. And, and, and the, the reason why, or I suspect, why you spend so much time and so dedicated to the craft of learning elk and elk behavior and hunting them with your bow and arrow. But, yeah, it's, um, it, it's nice to hear that uh, you mess up some scenarios as well. Oh, man, this year kicked my ass. <laughs> it was tough. We have some seasons like that, right? You just come up against it. Just, like, things won't go your way. Yeah, yep. and it's you know 100 right decisions, but it's also like uh, all the conditions have to go your way as well. The wind has to hold, or you know the totally. the elk have to make the right move, and it's really it's really it like it can happen really easily where uh, it just seems like it's going wrong time after time again, and you only need like aren't elk notorious for like i just needed one more step yeah i just needed him to just like uh not stop right behind that tree i just needed that cat like they're they're they have a knack for making those right moves in the end and especially those big old mature bulls that that you're chasing yeah 
I mean, I had the dumbest stuff happen this year. Like, <laughs> I mean, the wind got me a lot this year, a lot. Like, I couldn't have possibly put myself in a better position. Like, where I thought it was, this is going to happen, and then the wind would get me. That was that was the big one this year. But um, the one that cracked me up this year was big bull I was chasing, a 7 by 6 I had three different bulls I was chasing this year, and I'd kind of, like, periodically find one couldn't find the others chase this one for a while then i'd lose him then another one one of them would pop up and i'd get on him and it was kind of this it kept me in the game the whole time you know i was seeing them i knew they were there but the one day i thought it was going to happen i found one of the big bulls by himself which it was a weird year this year this was yep. like september 24th we've got a big mature seven by six probably like a mid 370s type bull by himself like not bugling not even acting like an elk that's in the rut just feeding doing yeah and uh found him in this tight little coulee real tight draw with only a few junipers and i watched him drop down in and then i sat there for a couple hours and he never came out and it was just like this little pocket and i'm like oh this is perfect like good solid win that day too and so i snuck in there and i knew i had all day to get in there so I took my time got in there got set up and I got behind this one juniper where I could range across this little pocket and it was 74 yards and then there was all these other trails right to like 12 yards one right in front of me and I'm like okay I got this I'm, I don't want to make that 74 yard shot but if he's calm and he doesn't know I'm here and I have time I know I can make that shot so anyway I'm like this is great hard wind in my face I sat there sat there sat there and it started to get dark to where I had about five minutes of legal shooting light left. And I'm like, did that thing sneak out of here? Because he should have been up on his feet by now. I mean, it's almost out of shooting light, you know? So I'm like, well, at this point, I got nothing to lose. I have to move or just do something. I can't just stand here, you know? I'm not kidding. I took about three steps. And that bull had been bedded on the backside of the juniper I was standing at for 45 minutes. We weren't seven Whoa. yards from each other <laughs> for 45 minutes. I didn't know he was right there. I knew he was somewhere in this pocket, but I didn't know he was right there. For 45 wow. minutes, I stood there with an arrow knocked, and he was seven yards on the other side of this bush. I didn't even know he was there. Just stood there, stood there. So I take like three steps, and he blows up just, you know, right out of his bed. Oh. And, and I just thought like, that's the kind of year I'm having. Like a lone bull mid-September doesn't even get on his feet before it's pitch black to even feed or like stretch or anything. It was just one of those wow. years where I'm like, yeah. I can't freaking catch a break this year, you know? That's amazing. That's so strange, dude. He to was catch those just conditions right like that. Yeah. Oh, man, what a killer. <laughs> uh, it, it, it crushes you too, right? To be so close and oh, to have yeah. them and think you've got them dead in the right setup, and then it falls apart. Like you got to get good at accepting <laughs> failure if you're going to be a bow hunter because oh, you, totally. you fail yep. a lot. And for you know, I know for me, every big bull I've killed or big buck I've killed, there's three or four that get away at least. Oh, you know, totally. they're they're crafty, and that's what keeps us coming back is that that challenge. So, totally. Um, Man, and that, that wind can be such a cruel mistress, too. You talked about uh, getting busted from the wind. It seems like it can be blowing the right direction the whole time. Uh, the whole time you're moving in, an hour <laughs> of chasing this bull, or two hours of coyoting the herd, and you just get into range, and there's no worse feeling than feeling that wind switch to the oh, back yeah. of your neck. And that's almost like the wind is almost the most frustrating thing when it goes wrong. Like sometimes I'll beat myself up and say, oh, I should have known better. But a lot of times it just swirls or it's just different where those elk are at or where those deer are at. It's yeah. just um, the way the winds move through the mountains. It's just a fit, uh, 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 cruel mistress at times. Oh, you know? man. man. I think that's one of the, the appealing things to bow hunters is I don't care how good you think you are. Or how many kills you've had there's still so many things that are out of your control that can make you fail in that regard of you know not getting that bull but i think that's the appeal of it because if it was easy it, it wouldn't it wouldn't have that appeal it, you wouldn't have the challenge there and that's why we keep coming back for more and more and more punishment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is we love that challenge and there's just that so much out of your control that it's just that's <laughs> it's amazing to me i mean that's why i'm so infatuated with it is because it's just difficult 
and it can just beat you down and beat you down, and then in seconds, oh, it's it changes it's in changed the, the game. Yeah, and, and you could you know have a bowl right in front of your face, and totally your season's over. Yep. Yeah, it's it happens all the time. You just feel like you're down and out, and you're like, oh, another one of these days. Next thing you know, you're like, this is gonna happen, and it happens quick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The beauty. Of, the beauty it, of it. it was so bad this year for me. I was trying to out. I was like trying to outsmart the wind. Like, what's when it switches? Which way is it gonna switch? You know. <laughs> yeah. then, so I'd like set up with a bad wind, going, "No way, it's gonna stay like this." <laughs> <laughs> like wind blowing right at the elk. Like, I got this figured out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so fun. It's almost like doing the opposite of what you think, exactly. right? It's like I failed so many times doing what I think will work. I'm just gonna do the opposite, and it may pan out. <laughs> I made the joke this year that my wind check is my elk finder now. Like, if I don't know which way the elk are, I'll just check the wind and be like, all right, they're definitely that way. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, that's so funny. But, you know, like in hunting, uh, creative thinking is rewarded. Like, sometimes it oh, is thinking outside the box, like your wind theory, where it's trying to plan which way it's going to switch. Like, uh, creative thinking uh, is rewarded in backcountry hunting. Like, it's not so black and white. It's really gray uh, when you're going to make your all-in moment or how you're going to kill them. And I know, like, it's a lot of problem solving. You guys talk about the love of the game and the challenge of it. Like, that's a lot of it is, like, your mind's constantly working. Like, you think you'd be in the woods and um, it's almost automatic what you're going to move, but it it's constant theorizing and where the animals are at. I'm not finding them on this side. Maybe they're in here. Constant theorizing, you know, like, like I... You know, I'll have a given setup that works for me or a common theme like where I'm going to try to stalk these bucks in their afternoon bed. But then those bucks may bed on a cliff face where I never have a shot or never have a chance to stalk them there. And all of a sudden, I've got to change my tactics and try to hunt them when they come out in the evening. So now I've got to play the winds differently. I'm not trying to play the uphill thermals. Totally. I'm trying to play the downhill thermals like that. Creative thinking and problem solving is a really fun part of the game, and it it's fun when it comes together. You know, it's like sometimes it seems like Mission Impossible, and like Jason says, then it just all of a sudden it happens. Like it's it's funny how effort and persistence is rewarded. You bet. Yep. yep. Yeah, I've kind of what we were talking about earlier. I mean, I've never considered myself any better hunter than anybody in this room. I just have time. Yeah, and yeah. with that time, you know, you eventually get those breaks. And I think having having time to study the animal, you know, the place to kill it isn't always where you see them. You know, in fact, most usually that's not the place to kill them is where you see them. It's figuring out those those little mistakes they make between point A and point B, those pinch points, those spots where the wind is just right on top of the ridge where they crest through that saddle where you gotta, you know, you gotta wait for them up on top where that wind's consistent instead of dropping into that pocket where you know it's gonna swirl. And and so it's it's watching them, it's figuring out their, where they screw up and just letting them do it naturally, not forcing it and then being at those spots where they have to go through those spots that they know they're not doing it right, but they have to, mm-hmm. you know. And finding those spots, those are the, those are the, the good, you know, that, that's the honey hole right there. and. And um, that takes time, though, you know, and a lot of guys don't have that time. A lot of guys have one or two weekends a year to get out there. And, yeah, if they see a good buck or a good bull, they got to run right at them. And I don't blame them, but, you know, what's given me success is time in the field and just watching the animals and let them really show you where you need to be, you know, just sit back for a while i know it's easy to get to a hunt and the first thing you want to do is boots on the ground get in as tight as you can but man i think those first couple of days of just doing nothing but sitting on the outskirts with a spotting scope and just taking it all in looking at the terrain figuring out the wind what are these bucks doing now what time do they head up there all this stuff and just putting it like in your playbook and then going back to camp and a day goes by two days goes by you start to see some similarities from day one to day two And then you start to just eke in on them, you know, and start to get in that zone. And after two, three days of then putting that pressure on them, then they really, you know, you're in tight and intimate with them. And that's when you really start to figure out, okay, here's where I need to be. Here's that little rise that I can get behind, or here's that one bush, you know, and yeah, that's... That's the game for me. And that's, you know, the big bulls chasing big bulls. I. 
I love the challenge of picking out a big bull, trying to find one big bull or two or three, like I said, and just focusing on those. And yeah, it's tempting. I mean, the last day I had a bow in my hand this year, I had two bulls come right past me at 22 yards, like decent bulls and hunting by myself, wasn't even filming that day. And, um, but the, one of the bulls I was chasing was like at 80 yards. And I was like, man, I didn't go through this whole season to get here and shoot one of these with the big guy right there. So I stuck it out. And the next day I woke up with like two feet of snow on the ground Ooh, and no, that no. was out east. So it was wow. like, it shut me down big time. And it was my last day to hunt anyway. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, I love that game. And I, I love the time of being out there, you know. Like we were saying before, it's it's the whole experience, start to finish, and and yeah, just reading the animals. That's one thing that doing the documentary films really taught me. And I know I've talked about this at like the Western Hunting Summit stuff. Is where I feel like I really excelled as a hunter was mostly when I wasn't actually pursuing the animals. You know, when my tag was filled, and I had a chance to just go out there and film and watch, but not pursue. That's when I really feel like I've learned the most yep. about the animals, mm -hmm. you know? And and that's like doing Project Elk. I mean, I had an incredible opportunity to film on a piece of property there. And those elk taught me so much over a period of two and a half weeks when I couldn't hunt. I didn't have, I had already shot my bull that year. And I was just literally camped out trying to get just the best film I could of rutting elk. That's all I was doing. And that was like the best two and a half weeks I've ever spent was middle of the elk rut, not hunting them, just observing. And like, I realized that everything they do is with purpose. And it's funny, it, I feel like it took me that long to realize I should have known that. But you know, with any animal that you see, they're not just like accidentally in that spot. There's a real hard reason why they're there. and. You really learn that. Like, every move they make is with purpose. It has to be. It's for their survival. It's not, you know. And and, and it sound, I feel like what I'm saying is like, well, yeah, obviously that's. But when you really see it, that's when the light bulb went off for me. Like, this isn't as hard as I thought it was. Like, they're really creatures of habit. If, if they bed here and the wind goes this way, they're going to take this route. If they bed here and the wind's going that way, they're going to take this route. If, if they're here and the wind's that way, they're going to water here. If, and, like, it literally is not that hard. Once you've been in an area a bunch and you really have a chance to study these animals, it becomes, like, black and white. Yep. But I don't think a lot of people have that time or look at it that way. I think they just think, like, i got to go here. And they don't pay attention to what is all going around, on around them, the weather, the time of the year. You know, uh, man, there's the so much direction. to it. Yeah, and, there's so but, much to it. But when you do like log that year after year after year in those same areas, they are, I mean, it's pretty darn predictable. And I feel like that's what's given me the success to, you know, continually get on big bulls was figuring out that, you know, when I was just filming them. And yep. so that's hard to do, though. Like, who wants to take that good chunk of their season and just not pursue? you know yeah but i mean that's a special time when you, you have that ability to do it and i think that's what really helped me develop in into a an elk hunter was guiding and so i spent so much time out there just watching and and just putting those pieces together that you're talking about why are they they doing what they're doing and i, I would say my abilities and my confidence progress so much by just having that time just observing yep it's huge i agree guiding was a big thing for me too yep. yeah yeah that you you learn on other people's mistakes and other people's time and yep yeah so much wisdom in in what you guys are talking about like that uh experience is the best teacher and the yeah. more time of field the more time observing uh, the, the better hunters we get. And I love what Jason was saying, like finding a, a chink in their armor, like watching them and um, uh, really observing them and then finding where their weakness is or when they yeah. put themselves in a susceptible spot. And, um, you know, I've killed a, a, a lot of bucks and bulls on my aggressive nature of seeing them and trying to close in. But uh, I feel like I get this wisdom, like the longer I hunt, 
the better I get at being patient and trying to realize when that moment is, when I do find a chink in the armor. And that element of surprise is so key to watch them and, and not have them know that you're hunting them and then be able to observe them. And, and just like Jason's saying, like the longer you watch and you're with these animals, you start to see what those patterns are and, and where they like to be and what they do under certain cer- uh, uh, conditions. And then you're able to capitalize on it. But it really is... Um, um, these animals are so tough to harvest and especially with the bow and arrow and getting into bow range that it's it, it's not going to happen on a half ass stock like it's mm-hmm. going to happen when you catch them in the right spot and then get down in there and capitalize on them so I just think that's so key at what you're saying and, and to add to it like um, learning the animals that you're hunting and learning their mannerisms and like you can read a lot of what that animal's thinking or what that animal's doing by the way his antlers are pointed or the how quick he turns around or where his ears are pointed and, and you can kind of read what that animal's doing and, and then to play off of it you you can hold up and freeze when they've heard something and they're looking in your direction and they're alert and you sit there for 10 minutes 15 minutes pretty soon they go back to being deer go back to being elk so you learn like these these tricks and these secrets but i i just think um it comes with experience and with age like i i uh the aggressiveness is really good for me this all-in attitude but just the more i hunt like the the more i just uh develop my patience and 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 being able to capitalize on these moments when i do see them and i think that's both what what you guys are so yep. good at doing i think i've i think i've proved to myself through because yeah you got to be aggressive too it's like no one to hold them no one to fold them sort of thing but I think I've proved to myself through the times where I've forced myself to be more patient as I've learned I usually have more time than I think I do yep yes I've always been like you know when you get a shot take it because it might be the last one you get and I've had that like mindset for a long time but what I've learned is if I let that one opportunity go by that I think might be my one shot Usually it just gets better. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I get in a little closer, they get a little closer, I get more f- good footage or whatever it may be. Like, um, I feel like I've learned I have more time than I think I do. You know, there's always factors at play, like spring bear, we always talked about, you know, it's a race against the sun a lot of times at night. You see the bear and you're like, okay, we got a mile and a half, it's whatever, 8.30, we got an hour before the sun sets. And, so yeah, I mean you got to basically run in there with everything you got to that spot where then you got to finesse in those last little, you know, precious yards or if mm-hmm. you're bow hunting, you you know, it's even tougher obviously, but it's uh yeah, in the long run I feel like I've learned that I I do have more time than I think I do yeah. usually. Yeah. Thinking about that over the years developing too. It, I've kind of got onto the the mindset that less is more when it comes to getting something, getting in on something. And I don't mean that like I'm putting less effort in, but don't overthink it. That that's what I've really kind of held on to and it's it's produced for me is less is more, a little more patience maybe, but just don't overthink it. I mean still, you know, uh, an elk and a deer their habits and their life is fairly simple. It's food, water, rest, and breeding season, you know, depending on the time of the year. That's it. And usually when we're hunting them, it's food, water, and bed, right? That's, that's what they do. That's pretty simple. And I've found that I keep, I keep it simple. I keep the movement simple. And you also know where to strike by just experience, right? By watching those animals. When are they going to be most susceptible? Sit back and watch when the time's right. Go in there and get it done because you're able to to see that. You're able to anticipate, mm-hmm. you know, where that opening is going to be. So that that's helped me a lot over the years is just that the less is more attitude. And, you know, I don't have to just be hiking all day. Maybe it's just sitting on a vantage. But still knowing when to apply that attitude of less is more takes time, right? Yeah. It just takes experience because it's, when I say that, it's not like I'm, I'm trying less hard or I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not waking up early because you are. But it's just knowing when to put that effort at the right times and then applying it to the situation to, to be successful. 
Yeah, you're so right, Dan, like trusting your instincts. Yes, and, and that takes a long time to trust that and believe in what you're doing. And the only way to get there is it working time and time again, and it just takes time. Mm-hmm. It's a crazy journey, isn't it? It, it is. gets me fired up. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Yeah, no, absolutely right. Like uh, uh, trusting your instincts and and uh, try try not like don't second guess myself. Like have confidence in my moves. Believe I can kill that animal. And then, yeah. you know, a, a, a big part of it is is like uh, you know Jason talking about those final few yards or that final approach there's so many right decisions that have to go into it but you get pretty good at um, uh, reading the situation like uh, 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 adapting to the situation and, and uh, adapting on the fly like making yep. those decisions yep. that now is the right time to close in now is that all time moment or, or I should sit back and be more patient and then really trusting your gut and trusting your instincts of what that's telling you and then you know not to go well maybe I shouldn't go in maybe the wind's going to do this or maybe I should try you know instead you just uh, uh, like you you react like it's almost like this visceral these these primal decisions that you yep. make and then trusting it and it's amazing it can seem like the toughest mission on planet earth like it's never going to come together and then all of a sudden he's standing there broadside inside range and you know you're able to put an arrow in him but that's uh that's the beauty of the game yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. it is it really is yeah so i think fun. about um like in a different sense but i when i feel like i really realize that animals made different sound like like they are actually saying different things it's not just a bugle every time it you know there's there's certain things that come out of it was was actually from lion hunting when i had my hounds you know following hounds and you you have that personality it within each hound you know and i i could be a mile and a half from my hound dogs across a canyon listening to them bark and i could be like molly's Molly is um, really frustrated right now. Smoke is off on a track that he's like trying to get them all confused. Like I could literally tell you what every dog was doing based on their bark and their cadence. And, and so even just like that when I was like, wow, man, yeah. If, if I can recognize this with my hound dogs, I mean, every animal has got these vocalizations, right? And I could, like I said, I could tell you play by play what was going on with that chase without even being right there with them. They would, they would make different sounds. They would chop differently. They would, you know, all these things. And it was, it was like clockwork. And that kind of got the wheels ticking as far as like, yeah, yeah they, they really are. They do say different things, reading their mannerisms, all these things. It's like I always laugh at whitetails when they do the head bob thing, you know, <laughs> because they'll like they'll look at you and they'll stare at you for like five minutes and then they'll do the like slow, like I'm going to go back to eating. Don't even worry about it. And you're like, nope, they're going to bob back up, you know, and you know this. So <laughs> yeah. they go back down instantly. They're <laughs> they give you the check yeah. out again. You're like, I knew you were going to do that. <laughs> and now you're going to go back to eat. And then they go back to eat. And you're like, okay, now I can get my bow off the bow hook or yeah. whatever. Yep. It's like, yeah, you, you learn that from mistakes. But yep. it is funny because they do it every time. I'm like, oh, no, it's good. I think I'm comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's so true. Like getting to know those animals. Um, that was I always liked to uh, uh, follow you. Like when you were um, working your hounds, one or two dogs, and man, um, setting those dogs like chasing those lions. Like uh, you put so much time and effort into it. You release those dogs, and you don't know what type of an adventure you're getting into. No. And it's the middle of the winter and and cold. Um, I always like following your adventures, doing that. It looks like a a, a really fun wintertime activity to watch yeah. your dogs work like that. It was, and I, I grew up with a bunch of buddies, and we did it just a ton. I mean, we'd have our canyons we'd all check, and we'd had our group of hounds, and whoever found the track, you know, five or six of us would go there, and we'd run. So almost every day we'd have something to run, and then, you know, the older you get, you have families, and this guy can't go, and that guy can't go. So it became a little more solo mission for me, but I, I enjoyed Yeah, it got me out there because the hounds needed exercise, and whether I was running them or not, you know, it got me out there and hiking the trails. And I enjoyed that. Like, my style changed through the years to the point where I would just pick a canyon with one dog, put my bow on my backpack, and I would just hike. And if I found a track, I'd turn her loose. If I didn't, I'd just go home for the day. And 
as a result of that, I'd maybe chase two lions a year. You know, I wouldn't get a lot of action, but I just enjoyed that style. I'd find wintering deer, and then I would just circle wintering deer and try to find those lions that were in there. And, yep. um, you, you houndsmen are really good at reading tracks. It's almost like a lost art tracking. And, and I can say, like, a, a, you know, I haven't paid enough attention to it over the years. Like, sure, I see a track or I see a buck track. I know they're in there. But uh, hunting these different places, like, that tracking is a lost art to be able to tell the story by the tracks. And, totally. And I find, like, myself now, like, I use it a lot in Arizona, like, uh, where the deer centered around water, walking around water tracks, walking up dry washes. It's like uh, really covering an immense amount of country and finding the tracks in the deer population and then focus on it because they're lower density. So I find myself paying way more attention to tracks. Yep. And, um, yeah. and and it's helped my overall game in other places, reading sign and reading tracks. But you houndsmen are really good at reading sign. That, that yeah. is an art. It, it, yeah, I enjoy it. And you do. You get good at it. It's like spotting bears or anything else. You know, you develop an eye for it. And... It, uh, it always blows my friends away when we're, we'll be like cruising down the highway doing 55, having a conversation. All of a sudden I'll be like, there was a lion track. They're like, how the hell did you yeah. see that? I'm like, it's literally ingrained. You, yeah. you know, they, the lion walks in a straight line. They don't drag their feet. It's a perfectly round circle. You learn all these things about different animals to where literally, yeah, you don't have to stop and look. You can be going 55 and looking at a field and be like elk, coyote, mountain lion. You know, I mean... Yep. It is. Yep. It's, it's awesome. I love it. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, tracking's huge for me all the way around. I do that, like you say, around water holes. You know, it just doesn't lie. You go to a water hole, you walk around, and you're like, there's not one, you know, you got this layer of dust on top or whatever. Nothing's been trampled. Like, yeah, nothing's here. You go to the next one, it's just pounded. You're like, okay, this is where it's at, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, but it, it's a uh, definitely a skill that we can all hone in on more too. Using those tracks in an area, or finding a large buck track. I know I've done that in the high country, and then I try to find the vantage points that show off that country. And sure enough, you find this older five, six year old mule deer, all from finding a big three and a half to four inch track that you can just tell with the the dew claws dug in. And, sure. Uh, there, there's um, uh, you know, it's not only tracking animals down; it's knowing animals are. In in that area but yeah that that track it's um it, it is a lost art but i always know going with you houndsman like you're uh, uh two or three levels above my tracking skill like you say going down the road and seeing a lion track go across i'm sure it, it helps you in your hunting as well like you're able to use that skill for hunting mule deer and hunting elk and picking oh, you up bet. on those yeah. you bet yep yeah and it's just you know knowing what to to look at i mean you could be just all the little things like you could be hunting a cattle ranch where there's cattle everywhere and there's tracks all through the snow and you see one track that goes up to a fence line and then continues on the other side of the fence you're like you it could be hammered with tracks that are all cattle and you could look out for two seconds and be like there's a deer track leaving the field far end right there it's the only one that jumped the fence it's clearly not a cow yeah you know so like yeah, tracking's huge, and it, it can speed up your um, the time it takes you to figure out an area big time, mm-hmm. quick, especially with snow. But yep, um, yeah, I, it is a lost art. And what's even crazier is if you go to Africa and see what those guys can do. That is insane. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they can pick out like one animal out of a herd of a hundred animals running together, and tell you that that's that track. You know, in a stampede of animals, it was crazy i wish i would have had more time to just learn from the trackers when we were there it was unbelievable what those guys could do with no snow on dry land you know just i've heard that that those guys are just amazing over dry land and rocks and picking out animals out of the herd like you're saying they'll Uh, they'll find like one you know basically animals hooves are just like our palms they they have a pattern to them and when you study it enough, that dirt in Africa, you know, it's fine enough that a lot of times if you follow long enough, you'll get a really good defined print. Like, you know, you can actually see like when an elephant steps, you know, you can see all those lines and it's so like those trackers. That is one thing I learned is they'll just they'll find like a fingerprint basically in that hoof print. And it may be one little chip out of the left side or it may be this one dark or like heavy line in the middle of their hoof it's something that they can see like just stands out to them and they can go through a herd and just keep 
little by lit, little, picking out that one animal, seeing it somewhere in those tracks and just keep going. And I wouldn't have believed it if they didn't prove themselves over and over and over, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, like, you know, you're like, well, maybe they're just doing this for show, you know, like make it seem like they really know what they're doing. No, they know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's wild. That's amazing. Yeah, that um, for us guys out west, that fresh snow just tells such a story of where the animals are at. And, oh, yeah. yeah you know, sun seeing hits tracks. it right at daylight. Oh, the yeah. fresh slope. And you're, it's just like the map is laying right there in front of you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're right. Like uh, glassing that terrain and glassing those tracks. Yeah, you can really turn up some animals that are pretty crafty or running a pretty tight program, and you, all of a sudden you see where they were feeding and where they <laughs> headed, and then you can turn up that herd. But yeah, that that tracking is such a great skill. You know, it's like all these skills that we just continue to develop. You know, to to our overall hunting skill to hopefully give ourselves a chance at, at success. You yeah. Know, at the end of the year. It's funny you say that. Being on a, a late season elk hunt this last year. It's fairly open country, and you get a fresh snow, and I mean, all you have to do is get a good vantage, and you're glassing for miles. You got a fresh sheet out there, and you can see tracks if it's worth even going over there, if elk had been out feeding on that south slope or whatever it is, and it really cuts down the time and the effort that you need to put in if, if you can see that, you know, from a vantage, and yeah, it's huge. I, I was, you guys were talking and I was like kind of chuckling on my elk hunts this year. It's like, yeah, the extent of my tracking is when I come back to the tent at night and, you know, the trail's all beat down and you that really fine powder dust and, you know, horse traffic on there. And then you wake up the next morning and you go back out to the trail and you just see these giant grizzly bear tracks <laughs> on the trail and you're like, huh, well, guess I gotta be extra careful today. <laughs> That's fresh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, G bears. That's a whole different a whole story, thing. man. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It sure is. It seems like it was funny. We were we were joking on some of those elk hunts that we were uh, doing this year, my archery hunt, and then uh, some. My wife had a rifle tag, and it's crazy how stealthy those G bears are because whether we were going in and out of the drainage or around to the next drainage, there was either grizzly bear tracks before us or after us in our footprints. But we never saw the bears. We, we never saw them, and it, it's always like that in there. It, it's just, it blows my mind. It, it's just a whole different. Well, at least they have that respect. Yeah. You know, at least they're acting natural and yeah, keeping that space. Exactly, and, and that's how respectful. they should. Yeah, yeah and, and there's some areas back there where, like up the North Fork of the Shoshone, that's, that's what all the locals say. That's where the naughty bears are, where, you know, a lot of guys have pro problems with them. But, uh, you know, farther south or, um, you know, maybe, you know, up the Grable or, or down by Dubois, I mean, some of the bears, I mean, there's still a lot of bears, but they still, they keep their distance and they, they don't do naughty things, yeah. you know, coming into your camp over and over and again. There's always exceptions, but sure. Um, yeah, it's just funny. The closer to the park you get, the worse it is, right? And it's true. Clo the closer you're, you're hunting to the park, the bears get less and less caring of human presence. Hmm. And so, yeah, it's just, anyway, that's a kind of a rabbit trail, but no, uh, that's it's, it. it's huge, yeah. Nothing makes me more leery, like you say, you run into one of those great big grizz tracks where you're hunting, you just like no one's in the area then. Like uh, before that, it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Like you're not too concerned right. with it because we all hunt in grizzly country, but then you see that track and you're like, yeah, there's a big one around somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I better right keep my head on a swivel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always told Schnees that they should make some boots that have grizzly bear tracks on the bottom of them, <laughs> like the soles, so I can wear them into my hunting area and keep everybody else out. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, you guys, uh, Jason, I really appreciate it. Where can guys check out your videos at? Uh, what do you got coming out this next season? Uh, so I'm stoked. I'm doing a film with Wild Sheep Foundation called The Selective that right I'm working on. on right now. That's yeah. about the history of trophy hunting. Oh, amazing. And doing a doll sheep hunt in the Northwest Territories. Nice. I'm going to go up there and nice. bow hunt dolls. Heck wow. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Good for you. So that's kind of the next big documentary full-length film that I'm working on. That's amazing. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this one. You know, I, I, I it's interesting because I noticed that you guys here at Eastman's have really started... Uh, in fact, I was watching something this morning that Ike was doing a seminar, and he said uh, trophy hunting is conservation. I'm like, yeah, exactly. That's the story that we're going to tell through this is, you know, 
trophy hunting has got its this black eye, but it, at the end of the day, it's a beautiful conservation management system that is the envy of the world, yep. you know? Yep. And it's just, we haven't told it right. And that's where I'm like, okay, it's, it's cool to see you guys stepping up, making a stance for that because it comes at a good time. I think we need to take that dialogue back. And that's where this film comes in. Just like creating a film that we can all, you know, if somebody questions us, share and say, hey, watch this. This does a good job of explaining where it started, where it started to like get a bad name or a bad rap, but why today it's still a beautiful thing that we should all celebrate. And um, like I said, I mean, there's a reason that we're the envy of the world when it comes to wildlife management. And it is the North American model of wildlife management, but it, that the very core of that is trophy hunting. And yep. so the reason yep. the film is named Selective is because moving forward, you know, working with Elk Foundation, working with Wild Sheep, working with Boone and Crockett, Pope and Young, that's the wording they would like to use more moving forward is selective hunting versus trophy hunting. And I do think that that word definitely is uh, a better descriptor of truly what we're doing is selective hunting, mm -hmm. you know. And I think it's going to be long-term, way more accepted, and it just explain itself through one word yep. differently than it ever has. And so it's kind of just trying to take back that conversation, <laughs> redefine it a little bit, and get get people in this room thinking about you know how to spread that message in a better way because it is something we should all be proud of mm -hmm. so absolutely yep. yeah yep. i can't wait for the film jason it'll be amazing <laughs> and to hear about the doll sheep hunt as well <laughs> yeah yeah how cool well uh thanks so much man i really appreciate you thanks dan for jumping yeah, on thanks for and having um me. yeah we'll keep in touch yeah i appreciate it guys always a good conversation heck yeah yep okay all right guys that's a wrap Again, just a fun conversation with three like-minded bow hunters. And um, I always love the content that Jason Mastinger puts out there. I love his videos, his storytelling ability. And uh, I'm always taking notes when I'm watching as well. He, he tells a, uh, just a great story. So uh, make sure to go check out everything he has going on. Again, Jason Matzinger is also using Vector Custom Arrows this year. Uh, I'm using Vector Custom Arrows. I'm just getting unreal groups out of them. Uh, again, they'll design that dynamic spine that's made it up perfectly to your bow specs, uh, which is a real asset. Great craftsmanship quality. They keep your order, so you can always just uh, pull up your account and order another dozen. So... I've got a couple more dozen on order and uh, get those here before my next trip coming up. So uh, make sure to check them out. Make sure to check out Onyx. Uh, everybody's heard of Onyx, but again, it's just such a great mapping resource tool. Uh, I use it for all my scouting, every hunt I do, for building my hunt plans. And uh, again, I'm, I'm on there nearly every day looking at some sort of spot somewhere of where I will be hunting. So check out Onyx, and then also make sure to check out Stone Glacier. I really like all those guys there. I really like the gear they're producing. This year I'm using their sleep systems. They have a great one-person tent that'll be coming out. They've got a, uh, a two-person tent that's a four-season. Uh, it's their skyscraper two-person uh, just a great all-around overall tent to survive any storms you're going to come up against. And the Sky Air, a great bivy tent, which is always my preference for early season. And it's a modular system where you can get a bathtub floor, you can get a vestibule in it. Uh, you can set it up different ways. Uh, so these are a single wall design. They're made to be ultra light. Uh, so this is what I'll be using for the majority of my hunts, or at least all the early season hunts, and then I'll switch over to that skyscraper two-person. But uh, great gear. Make sure to check out everything those guys are doing over there at Stone Glacier. Make sure to check out everything we're doing at Eastman's. Great new vids, uh, great content, and um, working hard over there. So um, check that out. Man, with that, um, yeah, doing good. Man, just um, working hard here. Made that trip back to Washington. Supported my family. That was good. Uh, hooked up with my cousin back there. I'm going to get him on the podcast. Um, man, just a, a true leader. Uh, really furthering his knowledge in human, human development. Uh, is really into um, breathing. Really into CrossFit. Uh, really into um, 
just his approach to life, his family, and things of that nature. I really respect that guy. So hooked up with him for a handful of CrossFit workouts. He did make me puke at one point, <laughs> which is crazy being in such good shape. But it just reminds me that um, it re- it reminds me that. Uh, uh, you know, that I have shortcomings too or weak points too that I can work on. And so definitely want to mix in more of those CrossFit workouts. In fact, I did one yesterday. Uh, I was working on a foundation late and got home, but uh, got in a, a workout. And so great for Chris to take me in his gym and teach me a little bit more about CrossFit, um, which is really cool. So uh, I, I haven't drank the Kool-Aid yet, but um, but I have. I, I really believe it works. And to do a workout, I ran 10 miles the day before, and then to do a workout that made me throw up, it made me feel like I was in the wrestling gym again. Uh, so, it, so it is good. Uh, I am going to be cognizant of injuries and taking care of myself and not getting too competitive, but also getting great workouts and great benefit from it. So going to be doing more of those uh, here in the future coming into this season, especially as I'm short on time this year, while still getting my endurance work in. I think that's so important as well. Strength, endurance, flexibility, all of it. So um, super pumped on that. Uh, so I've been doing more of those workouts and um, man, I got that bow just absolutely dialed in. Uh, I've got a trip coming up that uh, I'm going to be hunting Hawaii here for Axis deer and mouflon sheep. And um, I couldn't be more stoked going with a great group of guys and um can't wait to get after it and got this bow this new v3x oh my gosh is this thing a shooter uh you know you guys know that i'm so pumped on matthews is so pumped on last year's bow the year before bow uh but but this bow i've taken a lot of time getting it set up really working with the arrows the vector arrows are shooting perfect out of it i just got this bow so fine-tuned that these animals are in real trouble this year uh, the thing is just shooting amazing for me. Uh, so, so pumped on that. Uh, so, bow shooting in good shape. We're into bear season now. I'm tight on time this year, but I'm going to try to maximize my time uh, and get in um, some good hunting here as it starts to heat up. We live at higher elevations and takes a little bit longer. I do have a good early spot that I want to hit, uh, but uh, so I'll, I'll make a day or two out of that and um, then get after it here when it gets good. So uh, absolutely pumped for bear season, bow shooting, gears dialed. Time to go walk around the woods a bit, you know, and um, fall will be coming soon. So super pumped. Um, With that, guys, uh, that's the podcast, and uh, um, I'll check in with you guys next week.